Hi, and thank you for joining Fidelity Soundbites, a straight-to-the-point monthly podcast where we speak to some of Australia's leading portfolio managers on what's happening in markets, how they're positioning their portfolio, and the outlook going forward. I'm your host, Andrew Dowling, and in this episode, Paul Taylor, Portfolio Manager and Head of Investments for Fidelity Australia, joins us. Paul joined Fidelity in 1997, and he established the Fidelity Australian Equities Fund in June 2003. Paul, welcome. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? Yeah, well, thanks, and uh, appreciate you joining us today. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Look, um, certainly uh, interesting times, as always. It feels like uh, it's always uh, that environment that you operate in, uh, managing equities. Look, Paul, nearly two decades uh, of managing Australian equities and two and a half decades since you joined Fidelity, with the onset of higher inflation, one could argue you've nearly seen it all. What's currently happening in markets? What are you optimistic about? And what do you believe could derail what has been a relatively positive start to the year? Andrew, thank you for that. It, um, our markets are always interesting. There's always something new and different and, and uh, things to learn. But we, can, you know, there's also a lot to um, take away from what's happened in the past as well. So right at the moment, I think there's a couple of key issues in markets. The first would be we're still in that, um, you know, inflation, interest rate environment that's having a big impact on on markets. Uh, so we sit here in a, today in Australia, um, official interest rates three point one. You know, I guess expectations are maybe one or two more, um, and that's probably lowered a little bit from even if you go back six months. What expectations are where we might finish up on the on official with official interest rates? So potentially end up somewhere mid mid threes. Uh, I think the last inflation um, inflation numbers were about seven point eight percent. So that's still pretty that's still pretty high. So interest rates and inflation is having a dominant impact, but probably maybe a little bit. You know, interest rate where, where interest rates peak has come back a little bit, or maybe um, if they do go up a bit more, they'll they'll come back pretty quickly as well. So um, I guess there's a general feeling that even though interest rates are high, some of the supply chains, logistics are starting to free up a little bit. We're getting on top of inflation a little bit. Immigration's restarted, which I think's you know a critical part of all of this as well. So maybe um, interest rates aren't going up as high as as as, as um, initially thought uh, and then markets have responded well to that so you can see the markets probably through december and a little and then through january the markets have responded well that um you know we're going to end up maybe more like the mid threes in interest rates and that's i think that's probably a, markets have viewed that as a, as a as a positive outcome so that's the first part i think the second part is probably the china reopening is the other dominant theme in the market so china has now left behind the zero covid policy has reopened up you know people are moving about for chinese new year the obviously the covid-19 infection rate has gone up in china but now once again that's seen as a very positive outcome that we're mo- we're going through it we're moving forward uh, and australia is obviously highly linked or comp- Australian economy is very complementary with the Chinese economy. So, um, you know, what we make China wants and what China makes we want. Um, China's probably more uh, secondary industries, manufacturing. Australia's more primary and tertiary. So uh, the primary end, obviously, commodities, both hard and soft. And then also the tertiary end, you know, uh, don't forget we, um, a lot of Chinese tourists come to Australia, a lot of Chinese students. I mean, education is one of our big export markets as well. And that's just starting to reopen as well, post well living with COVID, but also um, as, as China reopens. So the China reopening play has a couple of big impacts on Australia. One is demand for commodities, and and what we're seeing is a commodity price going up. And just looking this morning, iron ores, you know, touching one one hundred and thirty US dollars again. So we're you know that's back up. We're seeing strength across a broad range of commodities, whether it's copper nickel, lithium, uh, a lot of the transition metals. But on top of that, people are looking more positively towards immigration, towards um, students and coming back into Australia in in terms of higher education uh, and just, you know, a a more broad opening, you know, of the economies. So I think they're the two big issues, China reopening, interest rates, inflation, both of them are headed in the right way. So, Interest rates may not peak as high as originally thought, and China reopening is going to is going to benefit Australia, and that has really driven the rally in uh, in January, 
And you know, if you look to the if you look to the to the year, and you can see obviously commodities and resource resource sector is incredibly well, it's very attractively priced, valued, strong balance sheets, um, you know, big dividends. So they're looking quite well placed for the you know for the for the next twelve months, as are a lot of those um, industries like education. That's that's you know dependent upon. Uh, you know, students coming in, people and students coming into the, into the country. So um, now, what could go wrong? So we're still, I guess, expectations for twenty twenty three is that the consumer will slow. Um, and I think, as we sit here today, consumer will slow, but we won't go into recession. I think uh, expectations in Australia, if, you know, GDP was will probably end up about three and a half percent twenty twenty two. We'll, we'll head back towards maybe one and a half to two twenty twenty three. So we're still growing, still, and no, no, no economic declines. But you know, the debt in Australia is really with the consumer. So the government has increased its debt through COVID, but it's still at very manageable levels. Corporates have incredibly strong balance sheets, and um, you know they're they're looking very strong. The debt really with the consumer. So as interest rates go up, you know that re- does put a strain on the consumer, and also a much larger percentage. Initially, went when when interest rates were very low, much larger percentage went to uh, like a fixed term, you know, maybe a three year uh, fixed rate. So that starts to unravel this year and this year. So but there's still a bit of uncertainty around how the consumer can react, how the consumer will react to the higher interest rates, and also will you know interest rates peak in that mid threes? That's still a question mark. So think. Yeah, you know, while we, I think it's right to to um, expect the economy to slow in 2023, but not go into recession. I think that's still a risk. I mean, we still could, if interest rates go a little bit higher, uh, and the consumers react a little bit more negatively. I think the, probably the one thing in our favour is that in, uh, unemployment's still very low, and really, unemployment is the key trigger as well. So. And when you look at um, uh, the consumer, to your point, uh, obviously you know, an impact on, on some out there with the discretionary income as we move into higher rates uh, to this year and uh, fixed rates coming off, how do you recession-proof your portfolio on, on that basis? How do you uh, position yourself uh, to, to ensure that you're in the, you know, the right positions with the right sectors and companies and avoid most of the worst? Yes, well, definitely um, that's the way we've definitely approached it. Uh, I think as you look at where consumers might spend their wallet, so um, while the wallet might be a little bit more constrained due to higher interest rates for those people that do have um, mortgages, for that part of the population that has mortgages, um, they're probably still going to spend on essentials. And so now essentials will be from your supermarkets, will be your healthcare, will be things that you have to buy. Now, they tend to actually have quite good pricing power because you've got to have them. Now, as we see food inflation come through, people will still – you know, you, you'll still want that and you'll still need that, so you'll pay higher. So if hundred dollars in your wallet, maybe you were spending fifty dollars on essentials in twenty twenty three, you might spend sixty dollars on essentials just because of inflation, because of the focus in that area. Now the other interesting thing that's happened is we've uh, through COVID we've moved between um, the goods sector and the services sector. And you know services has been a structurally structurally growing area of the market. But through COVID, everything, because we couldn't um, buy services, we couldn't travel, we couldn't go to restaurants, we couldn't eat out, um, everything, people spend their money on goods. So uh, goods went crazy, online went, went crazy through, uh, through COVID-19. Now that's reversing. So first of all, bigger spend on essentials. Um, and then second of all, within the discretionary component, what was almost entirely goods is now, and people want to get out, well, they want to travel, and you can see that with how hard it is to get a f- flight, how hard it is to get a restaurant, you know, people will want to spend on the services. So services is becoming a much bigger part of that discretionary spend, and goods is really sh- shrinking. So in a more difficult environment, obviously, we, we're, we're trying to make sure the portfolio has limited exposure to the goods, to, to discretionary so we, we're um, got a big focus on essentials. We've got a, some of a focus on services because that will still grow um, because of that structural move, but a very, very um, negligible exposure to, to goods. So I think that's the first the first part of it. I think um, 
as I talked about, you know, resources are well placed. So resources are well placed not only from a China reopening, but if you looked at the long term, uh, you know, we, we're going through a decarbonisation phase. Now that decarbonisation phase, interesting enough, is highly um, metal intensive. To get to that phase, we need to build build a lot of things and actually invest in a lot of uh, commodities and, and a lot of metals. And particularly the transition metals like nickel, copper, um, and lithium are, are really important through that process. Uh, through that process as well. So I think those sort of areas of essentials and commodities are really important. Thank you. And uh, look, when it does come to investing over the longer term, can you share with us um, just some of those key stock attributes that uh, that stand out through all seasons and cycles? Uh, it appears that you know, from a commodities point of view, we, we seem to have uh, all the various metals for all seasons and cycles. But uh, you know, naturally, what are some of the other areas you, you know you sort of the risks you try to avoid uh, right across your portfolio as well? Yeah, the thing when we look back and look at what stocks have really worked for us over time, and I think this is what what you see, you know, across um, a whole range of investors. It's really the compounders are the ones that drive the positive return. So when I say a compounder, that's a business that has high return on invested capital, so they've got some sort of competitive advantage. They're able to re- achieve a higher return on invested capital in the short term. But they're also, and this is really the important part, they're able to reinvest at a high rate. So they're able to keep that competitive advantage maybe for a little bit longer. So, you know, um, business theory would suggest that over time uh, that competitive advantage will get will get eroded. And, um, you know, how quickly it gets eroded is the, is the key point. And those companies that can hold it just for that little bit longer, uh, they, they, they're the ones that are actually creating a lot of value um, and will you know will will drive uh, you know incredible value creation through through the long term. So the compounders, uh, are, you know, are the great businesses. On the on the negative side, I think what typically you got to watch out for is uh, we're always very much focused on what's cyclical and what's structural, and you just don't want to get them confused. So if you think if it's actually cyclical but you think it's structural. Uh, you know, you, you're going to get caught. You're going to get you're going to get caught out. So that's we spend a lot of time working out which 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 is which, uh, and really not getting too caught up in and too much of a believer. If it's if it's a cyclical business, and everybody's saying, "Oh, it's, yeah, no, no, it's really now a structurally growth structural growth business." I don't I don't I think I've ever come across a business that's that's changed from cyclical to structural growth, uh, but it can really catch you out in in the long term. And the other thing you've always got to be careful of, and, and even through all different crises, um, you've got to be focused on the balance sheet. You've got to make sure. So if you go into a cyclical decline, you, the company has the balance sheet to get to the other side and come out and actually for you to, to, to earn, that re- earn that recovery. So I think, um, yeah, cyclical versus structural balance sheet are the things to watch out for. And the, re- and the really good businesses over the long term, um, you know, almost always consistently the compounders. Thank you, Paul. Great, great to talk to you, Andrew. You too. Thanks for joining us. And uh, that concludes today's uh, Fidelity Soundbite podcast. Uh, Thanks for joining us and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast via your favourite streaming platform and we'll see you next month. Bye for now. Some important information on today's podcast. This podcast is issued by Phil Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL number 409340. This podcast is intended as general information only and has been prepared without taking into account any person's objectives, financial situation or needs. You should consider the product disclosure statement and target market determinations for Fidelity Australia products at fidelity.com.au. Please click the link in the show's description to read the full disclaimer.